So Silence of the Lambs is hands down one of the best films of all time. It's one of my favorite movies. I remember when I first watched it, I had to pause the film two separate times and walk out of the room just to like get a breather because that's how much I felt like I was about to have an anxiety attack. But like in a good way, you know? Because the film, it was so suspenseful, I was literally holding my breath watching it. And I'm not the only one who feels that way. The Silence of the Lambs has been the only true horror film ever to win Best Picture at the Oscars. Um, you do have some other films like Parasite and then Rebecca in 1940 that have some horror elements mixed into them, but they're not a full, tired and true horror film like Silence of the Lambs is. Now I'll be the first to admit I haven't seen Silence of the Lambs in a very long time, so if I rewatched it now, I might feel like it's a little bit more predictable or I might not be as impressed by it, but when I first watched it, it blew me out of the water. Uh, the writing of this film, I thought it was incredible, like I said, so suspenseful. The director of this film is some guy named Jonathan Dem, and I took a quick glance at his IMDb page and I don't see anything else I recognize um, that he directed. But you know, if I was a Hollywood film director and the only good thing I had ever directed was Silence of the Lambs, honestly I would be okay with that because it's that good of a movie. This film was one of the first things that made me realize how powerful films can actually be. How powerful. Uh, proper camera work, good script writing, music, mise-en-scene, and good acting can be. And that is where our girl Jodie Foster comes in. I think she does an incredible job in this film at least from what I do remember. Her acting was just really convincing and her alongside serial killer Anthony Hopkins, what a pair. And again, I'm not the only one with this opinion either because she won Best Leading Actress in 1992 for her role in this film. Now I'll be the first to admit I probably love this movie so much just because, you know, obviously I'm very biased towards this film. This film was the catalyst that began my obsession with true crime and serial killers and eventually studying criminal justice in my university. Uh, Jodie Foster's portrayal of Claire showed me that women can do these really tough criminal justice jobs and do be incredible at them. This film was so inspiring for me the first time I watched it and, you know, obviously I'm very partial to it for that reason. It just has a really personal place in my heart. So with all that being said, Jodie Foster in this film, incredible. But, you know, I was thinking, recently what else have i even seen her in really uh, nothing that i know of she did direct one of my very top three favorite episodes of black mirror uh, archangel i think that's truly one of the best and most underrated episodes of black mirror and she directed it so she also directed and starred in a 2011 movie called the beaver the beaver originally was set to star jim carrey at one point steve crow at another point but they ultimately decided to go with America's sweetheart, Mel Gibson. I had this boyfriend once who was obsessed with Mel Gibson. Now, I'm obsessed with Taylor Swift. I don't know if you can see my posters in the background, but I have Taylor Swift posters all over my apartment, so I completely understand the idea of having a celebrity that's just like your person, you know, your celebrity inspiration. The only thing is, and we'll stick with a Taylor Swift comparison here, there's a huge difference in standing Taylor Swift versus Mel Gibson. In fact, let's play a game to figure it out. Welcome to What is the Main Difference in Supporting Taylor Swift versus Mel Gibson. We couldn't come up with a catchier name. Is it A, Taylor is a singer-songwriter while Mel is an actor? B. Taylor is a girl, but Mel is a boy. Or C. Mel Gibson has an extremely lengthy history of putting his foot in his mouth claiming many times it was due to alcohol and or mental breakdowns, and he once pleaded no contest to domestic abuse claims toward an ex-girlfriend and was charged with misdemeanor battery. While Taylor Swift does not. Now we don't have time to unpack all of that! But let's just say the uh, domestic abuse charge came out around the same time as this film, and despite the film being fairly positively received, it bombed at the box office due to Mel's controversy. So we start out with the first scene very strong. You've got Mel Gibson in a pool floating on by, and we get an incredible feet shot right next to the title, 
Yummy. Also, this scene is so funny because we have zero context for it. I mean, it's literally the first scene in the film, of course, and uh, for all we know, Mel Gibson could just be chilling in this pool that's not even, like, his character's own house in the background, you know? By the way, honey, I'm gonna need you to go by the store tomorrow and pick up some more milk, and could you give me, like, a box of Cheez-Its as well? Hey, babe, you okay? I think... I think Mel Gibson is floating in our pool. <laughs> what? Yeah, and he... he looks dead. Come on, no, let me see. <sighs> oh my god, I think you're right. Yeah. He has some really nice feet, though. A hopelessly depressed individual. Join the club. So basically, we get this overhead narration with a little montage of Mel's character, Walter, trying tons of things to fight his depression, but nothing's working. He is so depressed. So depressed, in fact, that he gets into bed with his boots still on. I've had depression for years. It has been one of the hardest things in my life. So, you know, I get Walter's struggle, but not once have I felt so depressed that I slept with my shoes on. I mean, you could just, just kick them off at the end of the bed. Like, now you can at least have a comfortable depression nap. So then we find out from the very British narrator that Walter's depression has affected his family as well. His youngest son is becoming very solitary and feels really ignored by his father, while his older son is obsessed with figuring out every similarity between him and his father and writing it down so that he can, you know, get rid of it in himself because he does not want to end up like Walter. I also noticed right here, it looks like there might be like a hole in the wall, unless that's just like a weird shadow, but it looks like he punched a hole in the wall. So, what do you think his name is? Kyle. So, turns out, I made a little uh-oh, uh -oh. whoopsie. Uh, turns out, when we're first getting introduced to the family, the narrator actually does say the eldest son's name. I just completely missed it the first three times I watched it, and I already wrote and recorded all these jokes, and I will be leaving them in because I think I'm funny. However, what we can conclude from this is that either Mel Gibson's British accent is so bad that that is what led me to not at all hear what he said, or just British accents in general are undecipherable. I'll let you think on that one. There she is, the star of the film, Miss Jodie Foster. Her character, Meredith, is of course, you know, Walter's wife, and she buries herself in her engineering work, which I guess is just playing a roller coaster tycoon. So then we see Meredith kick Walter out, and at first this part pissed me off, because it's like, that's your husband. You married him for better or for worse. You should help him fight his depression. It looks like he's trying, you know? But later in the film, my opinion on this did change. So now we officially meet the eldest son. In this scene, where we see that he's kind of a smarty pants. His uh, Jason Dolly in the 2008 Disney film Minutemen looking friend is asking him to write a paper for him because he's failing the class and he did it for their friend Hector, so why won't he do it for him? So Walter's son eventually does tell his friend he'll write the paper for him after shoving him into a dark hallway and making him pay $200 in a very shady drug deal looking exchange. So, okay, school is in session. Literally immediately after their conversation ends, the school bell rings. So, so students are here. Why are the lights in this hallway off? 
I tried to think of any sort of joke as to why, you know, the lights were off, and I can't think of anything. I just, I don't get that part. Why were they off? The friend also remarks that the $200 is more, more than I pay, pay for weed. weed, as if we needed any help telling that this guy is a stoner character. Then, we see her. Ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer fucking Lawrence, J-Law herself, is in this film. Now when I realized this, I was like, oh my god, this was only one year before The Hunger Games, which, you know, basically made J-Law J-Law. The Hunger Games pretty much turned her into like a household name, but just a year prior, she was in this bomb of a movie. Now in her defense, things were actually a little different than I just made them sound. The Beaver was actually filmed in 2009, and it didn't come out until 2011. Now in 2009, Jennifer Lawrence was essentially a nobody. Obviously she'd had her role on the Bill Engel show, of which her role was very well received. Um, I've never watched it. I wouldn't know. And she'd had her film debut in Garden Party in 2008. Not such a well received film. Followed by The Burning Plane, which Wikipedia calls a critical and commercial failure and Poker House, which was the most well-received film out of the three. So J-Law had the Bill Engel show, those three films, and a couple other really small roles under her belt when Winter's Bone came out, which earned Jen her very first Best Performance by a Leading Actress Oscar nomination at just 20 years old. I am 22, and this is what I am doing with my life. The film was also nominated for Best Picture of the Year. This was all at the 2011 Oscars. The same year this film, The Beaver, that Jen had filmed back in 2009, finally came out in 2011 when Jen probably could have gotten a lot, you know, bigger role by then. Obviously she did. The Hunger Games. The reason for the large gap was because uh, this film actually wasn't ever going to come out. Because nine months after uh, filming completed, and you know, the film was getting ready to release, Mel Gibson decided to uh, beat up his girlfriend. Allegedly. So the studio basically scrapped it until 2011 when they, you know, finally were like, alright, fine, we'll release it. So, cut to Walter coming out of a liquor store with a box full of alcohol. Drowning your sorrows and depression in alcohol is, as we all know, a brilliant idea. But, uh oh, uh -oh. Walter couldn't fit his alcohol in his car because, remember, Meredith kicked him out of the house. So he's got a bunch of shit in there. Uh, so instead of doing any sort of rearranging, um, he just throws all his shit away in a garbage bin. And when he's looking in the garbage bin, he notices something. No, it is not a heroin needle. That is not the direction the film is going. It's a beaver. No. It's the beaver. So Walter takes the beaver, goes back to the hotel room, and starts drinking. After several drinks, he's stumbling around with the stinky, stinky beaver puppet on his hand. Walter then decides to give 1972 David Cardine uh, some alcohol, and this wonderful scene happens. Here. There you go. You moved. I'm gonna be honest, Mel's delivery of those two words, you moved, was hilarious. It was so good. I was laughing so hard. Oh my god. Um, so then he tries to kill himself by hanging himself in the bathroom and he fails and he's still got the beaver on his hand so instead he's just like, I'll just jump off the balcony. But someone stops him. Oi. But he ends up dying anyway because the TV crushes his skull. Kidding! We're only 10 minutes into the movie. This isn't Game of Thrones. Walter wakes up after what seems to be a few hours and this scene happens. You want things to change? I mean really change. You gotta forget about home improvement, Walter. You've gotta blow up the whole bloody building. What are you gonna do, Walter? Blow it up. Blow it up! Blow it up! Blow it up! Blow it up! Blow it the fuck up! Blow it up! Blow it up! Timothy McVeigh be like. Who are you? 
No, I'm the beaver, Wooda. You said the name of the movie. What are we? Some kind of suicide squad. So after this, Meredith goes to pick up their youngest son, whose name, by the way, is Henry. Found that out from the subtitles. Uh, from school, but the teacher is like, no, Walter already picked him up. He said he sent you a text. And the teacher says, your husband is quite the character. Meredith doesn't really have time to think about what this means, though. She just checks her phone and then she rushes home. She's, you know, probably a little freaked out. When she gets there, Henry is there and he shows her some little memory box. And she's like, did you and your dad make this? And Henry says, no. Me and the beaver made it. And then right on cue, out walks Walter. So, you know, Meredith obviously is confused, and Walter steps out of beaver character for a moment to explain to her it's a type of program his doctor prescribed to him, and it's supposed to help him recover from his depression, um, and he's gonna need their full support. And apparently, the program is very popular in Sweden. It's very big in Sweden. Henry seems to be really excited that his dad slash new beaver dad is finally paying him any attention, so he begs his mom to let dad slash beaver dad stay for dinner. Next scene, we find out why J-Law wanted off-brand Elijah Wood to meet her in the gym. She wants him to write her something, and he scoffs and is like, Bitch, you're valedictorian. You're just trying to rat me out to the principal, and I'm not gonna fall for it. But turns out she's being serious. She needs help, not with an assignment, but with writing her graduation speech. This is the scene I decided I hate this kid. Um, his character is the worst. No way. Why? Because it's one thing for your little anorexia squad to get by on their looks. That's all they've got. But for someone like you, it's just it's so lazy. A fucking pardon? But cheerleader J-Law defends herself. You go, girl. And after letting him keep all the papers she shoved at him to make her point, she walks off calling him a douche. So the elder son, who looks like every army recruiter ever, arrives home and is not impressed with his new beaver dad. No, it seems a bit I'm not talking to you, nutjob. I'm talking to mom. It takes you years to get him out of here and you let him come back the next night with a talking hamster? It's actually a beaver, son. It's the name of the movie. Try reading the script next time. We find out that dinner that Walter's dad was very distant and depressed and killed himself a while ago. I think this scene is really interesting because we get a little glimpse into part of the reason why Walter is the way he is. A lot of research suggests that mental illnesses do run in families and this is the part of the movie where I was kind of like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Good night, mate. You think he's washed that thing yet? So our buddy Porter says he'll help Nora write her speech for $500. And he sort of not really apologizes, not really for how he acted earlier. And she just interrupts him and is like, just come by tomorrow. So then Porter sees his dad leaving and is not impressed. I was right! Parsley, I feel like smashing your head into a wall is a lot darker than punching a wall, but, you know, that's just one gamer's humble opinion. Oh, he finally did watch it. Good for him. So Walter's actually CEO of some big toy company handed down to him from his dead daddy. He got the job two years ago and even says he didn't deserve it, but only got it because he was next in line. So that leads me to think that his father killed himself about two years ago, maybe, you know, a little bit over that. That is what could have sent Walter into his depression spiral. But just a few scenes ago, Henry asked what happened to Walter's father and they have to tell him, but Henry is obviously way older than two years old. So if Walter's father killed himself two years ago, Henry would have remembered him at least a little bit, you know? So either this timeline is all fucked up, or Walter is a time traveler. So anyway, Walter calls a meeting and his employees are like, What the hell is this? Walter slash the beaver present a business plan to get the company back on track because they are almost in bankruptcy. And he asks that the employees give him two weeks to 
carry out his plan and prove himself to them leadership wise and then if anyone wants to resign at the end of the two weeks he'll give them severance pay and a glowing, glowing letter, letter of, of recommendation. recommendation who exactly are you supposed to be oh bollocks did i forget to introduce myself you may simply call me the beaver what are we some kind of suicide squad porter heads over to Nora's to help her with her speech okay well how do you want people to feel when you're done? I guess I just want them to feel not let down. Not let down. It's powerful. I'm excited, pumped. How are you doing? Me? I'm not let down. <laughs> okay. Say what you want about J Law, but she's such a cutie. Are we talk about you getting expelled from eighth grade. How did you find out about that? No secrets on the internet. FBI, open up! Well, I mean, what did you do? You steal some encyclopedias? Chew some nicotine gum? No. What? <laughs> no. I killed someone. So it turns out Nora was expelled just because she painted graffiti. Porter is like, let me see some of your old art. Nora shows him. Nora says that she threw all these paintings out, but Porter replies that, well, someone must have cared about her a lot to go get them out of the trash because, you know, they're here now. And so, you know, there's these hints that someone was in Nora's life who isn't anymore. Nora's weird-ass mom then shows up and makes Porter leave, but not before there's a little flirtation at the door. You're a little more different than I thought you'd be. You know, for someone I'm paying a lot of money to write a speech for me, you're not very articulate. How much better on paper? <laughs> we'll see. They're supposed to be writing a speech, but... I don't know, it seems more like they're making chemistry to me. So then we get a montage of things seeming to look up for everyone in the family. We also see this cute little bit here of Nora sending Porter a selfie, which I personally think is definitely J-Law's better selfie if we're comparing it to the Oscar selfie that would come a few years later. What do you want me to talk about? Doesn't matter, just talk. Yeah. You have a funny voice. Well, Henry, according to the subtitles in the beginning of the film, the beaver talks with a Cockney accent. Is it accurate? Hell if I know. I've never been to England. One thing I know that is accurate, though, is that the beaver is supposed to be British, obviously, and he has bad teeth. So. You're quite easily entertained, aren't you? Yes. Goddess. <laughs> yes, hello, Peter. So Walter slash the beaver come up with a new toy idea for a talking beaver woodworking set. And this wonderfully sweet lady, who's the vice president of the company, helps him out with it and production in the company increases and none of the employees resign at the end of the two weeks. Walter, Meredith, and the beaver have a lot of threesomes and now it's their 20 year wedding anniversary. And Meredith is getting upset because she does not want the beaver to join their date in his little build a tuxedo. Porter and Nora also go out on a date, and Porter takes Nora to paint some graffiti shit, but Porter does the weirdest fucking thing. He writes, R.I.P. Brian, okay? Brian was Nora's brother who passed the person who got her paintings out of the garage, and I assume Porter found this out through the internet. She basically is like, okay, you freak, who would do this? And then, um, of course, the police show up because they are committing an illegal act of vandalism. So meanwhile, Meredith and Walter are also out on their date, and the beaver does come, but Walter is out of beaver character, and he's back to his depressed, emotionless self. Uh, so Meredith gives Walter a memory box as a gift full of pictures of the kids, you know, from when they were happy. And Walter has what I think is a panic attack, and the beaver takes over. Walter slash the beaver says that this is the past, and he basically threatens suicide. Jodie Foster then delivers what I personally think is a great little monologue. She says she knows that the old Walter is still in there, while Walter slash the beaver is like, no, Walter is a lost cause. Meredith says she's fought for Walter for two years when he couldn't even get out of bed. 
again, making me think that his father's suicide is what triggered Walter's big bout of depression. She says she's still going to fight for him because she loves him, but she has to know he's coming back to her. Walter storms off, but they both go to the police station to get Porter. Walter is in beaver character now. Nora and her mom are like, this family is fucking crazy. Porter and Walter fight, and uh uh-oh, uh-oh, that's a big hole. No wonder Porter thought writing R.I.P. Brian would impress Nora. He has brain damage from smashing his head through their house. So Walter comes home, and Meredith is like, I called your doctor. He said he didn't prescribe this program. Duh, Meredith. And in fact, he hasn't been to see the doctor in over a year. So we can assume that for the first few months after the two-year period Walter has been depressed after his father died, that's when he was trying to get better by doing all the treatments and whatnot, but eventually he just gave up and stopped going, and that's when he just, like, would sleep all the time. So this was when I understood now why Meredith kicked Walter out. With depression, you have to make the choice to work to get better. Uh, Some people, like myself, need a push of medication to help us get the mental strength and motivation to make that choice. But from then on out, you know, then I have to work too. You can go to therapy after therapy session, you know, take tons of medication, and of course those things do help and are often necessary parts of battling depression but you cannot rely on those things alone. You have to fight for yourself. You have to make the choice to actively try and get better. And making that choice is one of the hardest things about depression, you know? That's why a lot of people just never make the choice and they just choose to sort of carry on with this depression, you know, in, and they just hope that medicine or therapy will fix them with no action on their part. But that's not realistic. It is a bunch of things combined, and you also have to make the choice to work to get better. It seems that Walter never made this choice, he never actively tried to get better, and instead has entered into some sort of disassociation with the beaver. When Walter is the beaver, he isn't depressed. He isn't the depressed man who has failed himself, his company, his father, and his family. Walter thinks he's too far gone for recovery, and he hates himself. He hates the depression, he hates how much he's hurt everyone, and he sees no coming back from all that. So he's just become a new person, essentially, with the beaver, which seems like he's just trying to distance himself as far away as he can from himself. Inspiration just comes to you in the middle of the night. Oh, how fun. Matt Laura from the Today Show. This movie's just full of awful men, isn't it? Next thing you know, O.J. Simpson's gonna be making a cameo. So people are obsessed with Walter slash the beaver, but Walter quickly begins to deteriorate. Being the beaver isn't exactly making him as happy as it originally seemed. This gives us one of the best fight scenes in all of cinematic history. Hang up. You hang up right now. You'll never win. Marvel movies need to learn from that scene. So the fight scene results in multiple injuries to both parties involved. The Beaver and Walter are now becoming two distinctly different people. At first, it just seemed that Walter was communicating through the Beaver. But now, it feels like the Beaver is a manifestation of Walter's self-doubt, his fears, his feelings of worthlessness. Uh, And then uh, Walter chops his Beaver hand off. Don't do it. It'll be worse than before. Much worse. You want to end up a worthless, lonely piece of shit? You're nothing without me, Walter. Nothing! The only part of you that works. So 
then we get a montage. Nice VP lady is now CEO of the toy company. Uh, Porter's underground paper writing business gets found out and he gets rejected from Duke. And Walter's new hand reminds me an awful lot of this. Meredith and Henry go visit Walter in what I think is a psych ward. And it seems that Walter is on the road to recovery. Porter still doesn't want to go see his father. Um, and he sort of starts to realize he might be getting depressed as well. Nora is at the R.I.P. Brian Wall and asks Porter to meet her there and he sees she's made this big beautiful artwork and she was like, you were right, I did need to talk about my brother and they make up and kiss and never discuss how creepy he is and Porter ends up writing her a speech but she goes rogue and delivers a monologue that honestly kind of was really good. So while everything may not always be okay, one thing I know is true. You do not have to be alone. Nora's speech encourages Porter to go visit his dad and they hug. There's this little ending scene where everyone is happy. The whole family's together. Nora and Porter are together. And suddenly I am crying over a movie in which a man beats himself up with a beaver puppet. So I have seen this movie once before and I the only thing I remembered about it was that it was bizarre. But watching it again, I very oddly enjoyed it. This is a very good representation, I feel like, of, of depression. And I found myself relating to Walter and I, I felt for him because I understand what that's like. I found a uh, user review on IMDb, and I think this review sums up the movie perfectly. Although it's difficult to watch Mel Gibson now without the backdrop of alcoholism, abuse, bigotry, rants, and disappointment, this role may actually be the perfect role for him to reappear on the screen with sympathy and hope of redemption. He plays the role perfectly and the viewer is sucked into the emotion and distress of all the characters dealing with their own challenges. It's a beautiful movie with a powerful message. Some have criticized Jodie Foster's directing, but I found the film to be very balanced with the right amount of comedy and tragedy. I love the camera work and editing, especially with the beaver as its own character. I also enjoyed the secondary storyline about the teenagers. All the performances were very good. I think the entire movie is very well done, and although I have not changed my personal opinion of Mel Gibson at all, the movie does make you very sympathetic toward families dealing with crises of their own, and as an actor he pulls off a very difficult role. So, The Beaver. Um, so I have this list, it's just, you know, my own personal list of movies I think everyone should watch at least once in their lifetime, and I might have to add this one to the list, I'm gonna be honest with you. This film was uh, bizarre, and, you know, there is the Mel Gibson aspect, but it's a good movie. I like it. Hello, yes, it is a different day. It is many days later. Uh, so, but yeah, I'm gonna have to recommend The Beaver. As odd as that is, because I expected it to be bad, but it's really not. And you can literally just go to the IMDb page and watch it for free. Um, you just have to have an IMDb account, which I didn't even know IMDb offers free movies. I guess it's just box office flops mainly. And I know I kind of spoiled this entire movie, but I do think it's worth watching. I also wanted to say, you know, thank you so much for watching this video. I wanted my first video to be about a topic that I thought was good. So when I thought to do a video on this, you know, I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. It'll be easy, in and out, done kind of thing. And it was not. I worked my ass off on this video and I'm very overwhelmed that it's so long, meaning no one is going to watch the whole thing except for my best friend Brandon. Hi, Brandon. But, you know, that's okay. I had fun. I'm proud of it. And so, you know. If you want to like the video, that would be super nice though because I crave validation. If you hated the video though, or if you just hate me, I know there's plenty of you out there, make sure you give it a big old thumbs down. And while you're at it, go ahead and type some hate in the comments. I would love to sit and argue with you in YouTube comments. Anyway, thank you guys. Here, since you want to be in the video so bad, you want to say something? Yeah? Okay. Can I make a turd? <laughs>